in looking at different traditions and different thought, one of the things that's always fascinated me is figuring out what's at the core, what's at the heart of where a certain tradition starts and what they take for granted. If you start with certain background assumptions, your philosophical bunkers, where just you have to take everything else for granted, then addressing the rest of the philosophical landscape, right? Like certain problems come up in, in different ways. And for me, the fascination has always been comparing and viewing what's going on yeah. from really different angles in, in that way. I'm Malcolm Keating, and you're listening to Sutras and Stuff. Today on the podcast, how does encountering Indian philosophy make a difference in our thinking about how philosophers do philosophy and how they teach it? This episode is number eight in a series of conversations with philosophers who have taught Indian philosophy at Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, an unusual liberal arts college where students first encounter philosophy through a global two-semester sequence, which includes not just Indian philosophy, but Chinese philosophy, Islamic philosophy, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and works from European traditions. Because this academic experiment is ending in 2025, I wanted to hear from professors who came to learn about Indian philosophy by teaching it in this global context. Most of them were experts in other areas of philosophy first. So what did they learn from this experiment? Did it change their understanding of themselves, of philosophy, of the world? Thanks for having me, Malcolm. My name is Cathay Liu. I am currently a senior lecturer at NUS in their new College for Humanities and Sciences. So it's kind of they're integrating two sides of the school. Um, and I'm teaching a new course there called The Human Condition, which is actually very similar to a course that I took at UC Irvine, which I loved. It's called Humanities Core that kind of does philosophy, literature, and history all kind of integrated into one, which has been delightful. So my, my research interest is in early modern philosophy of science and math. Um, I'm interested in the scientific revolution and all the conceptual shifts that happened around that period that led to modern sciences as we understand it. One of Cathay's philosophical interests, which we'll hear about in this episode, is the French philosopher René Descartes. Cathay is interested in philosophical systems and in understanding how philosophers like Descartes think about the relationship between different parts of their system. For instance, how Descartes understands the relationship between algebra and geometry. As one of the inaugural faculty members at Yale and U.S. College, Cathay was deeply involved in designing and teaching the Philosophy and Political Thought course, or PPT, from the very beginning, which began during a year of institutional design at Yale University in New Haven. And we had that glorious year to kind of do nothing but read and study and, and learn all sorts of things that we didn't already encounter. Um, and I came in with experience teaching Chinese philosophy, but I had never taught Indian philosophy before and really didn't even know where to start. So it was really kind of a glorious year of just exploring intellectual curiosity, um, encountering new texts. I think it was also really helpful getting a sense of what the experience of a student might be like, kind of encountering these texts for the first time and not knowing where to start or how. I, I think... I relate to the students like anxiety of wanting to be like, is this the right reading or am I am I looking at this text correctly? So, so tell me more about that. How did it what did it feel like when you were encountering it for the first time as someone who had taught Chinese philosophy, worked in early modern European philosophy and now is encountering pre modern Indian texts? I think it's always this balance. I think because I've I have experience with Chinese philosophy and the canonical Western canon, I knew that one of the things that was inevitable was this attempt to import conceptual distinctions and frameworks onto a text in which they didn't belong. And I, I was hyper aware that that was probably going to initially color my reading for better and for worse, like some sometimes maybe to help me 
kind of get a handle on a topic or a debate, but at the same time, like, probably cause a lot of misunderstandings and misreadings. And I think I, I have this love-hate relationship with that. On the one hand, I, I do think it's necessary in some sense. Like, you just can't help it. It created a lot of anxiety, probably. Perhaps it has to do with philosophical temperament, like, and how much the anxiety of correct reading is, is bothering you, right? There's this aesthetic appeal to me of wanting to see through the eyes of all of these other thinkers. And I, I, it's strange to me that I had not noticed it until I've been reading all of these different thinkers. So that now if I go pick up a, a, a text like King Melinda. That's the questions of King Melinda, which we've talked about in a few episodes this season. My first instinct still is to be like, oh, this is kind of like, insert whatever, like, you know, analytic philosophical tradition there, right? Um, to think about it and then also take a moment to step back and then be, I think, like, get a little bit better of like, okay, well, hold on. Let me just get through the whole book and figure out what are the main questions that are popping up for each thinker and thinking about, like, why are those questions the salient questions of this particular text and where where it exists in the larger discourse and, uh, of its time and aim for the stars at that point and think about what are the concept, fundamental conceptual views in the background. One of the texts that Cathay thought about systematically, in addition to the questions of King Melinda, is the Tarka Somgraha, or the Primer on Reasoning. Anumbatta is the author of this text, and he was a Nyaya philosopher who lived in the 17th century. Nyaya philosophers were concerned with how people come to know using reasoning, and they're often called logicians or, in Sanskrit, tarkikas. So I really liked teaching Anambata, both from a teaching standpoint and just a lot of connections with just how I'm thinking about philosophy. I mean, starting from just teaching, especially for for our first-year PPT curriculum, one of the things we have to do is help them learn how to write and write clearly, write well, think about reasoning and evidence and support. And I actually had been using the craft of research, right, and using that kind of formula, this claim, reasons, evidence, warrant. The craft of research is an influential guide to doing research and argumentative writing. And by the time we get to Anambata, which is about like the fourth week of the semester, we've already practiced some writing. But Anambata is is great because he comes in and even though it's not supposed to be about formulas or like forms of reasoning, like modus ponens or something like that. He's dissecting what an inference for yourself kind of looks like from the inside and then how to persuade other people. Now, inference for another should have five component parts, according to Nyaya. The standard example they give is this. The mountain has fire because the mountain has smoke. And wherever there is smoke, there is fire like a kitchen hearth, and unlike a lake with mist rising from it. The mountain is like the kitchen hearth, and so the mountain has fire. Season two of the podcast is entirely devoted to Nyaya, so if you want to hear more about how inference works, you can listen to that. I'll also put a link in the show notes to some YouTube videos I've made about Anambata's work. I love it because it maps on very well with claims, reasons, evidence, and warrants, and particularly warrants, which is something I always have a hard time explaining to students. As I tell them, you have to explain why your evidence works as evidence and how it connects to the reasons and how both of those things actually feed into the claim, right? It's all the subtle parts that you might take for granted. Rule application, actually, even though that goes very quickly, I find that that's a really instructive moment for the students. I'm like, look what has to happen. The rule application is kind of connecting the illustration back to the reason and showing the parallel in the reasoning, right? Like yeah. th This applies in this specific case. The rule application is a small statement that says this is like that. In the example of smoke and fire, it's the statement that says the smoke we're observing on the mountain is like the kitchen fire, where we've observed smoke and also fire. Cathay uses this idea in her teaching to help students see the importance of using examples to support claims. She also sees some connections between Anambutta and one of his close contemporaries who lived in Europe in the 17th century, René Descartes. Analytic philosophers do it in this tradition of premises and conclusions. But oddly, you know, even as someone who works in that tradition, Descartes has always really slammed traditional Aristotelian logic, right? He's like not into 
forms of reasoning in that sense. And so when he wrote his text, which is similar to Anambata, I think, the rules for the direction of the mind, he explicitly says there, I'm like, I'm not trying to tell you what are the the forms of reasoning. I want to think about what good reasoning looks like. And a lot of it is about figuring out the right categories of things and then figuring how to work with, once you sort out the categories of things to use, how to relate them and to then use the intuition of your mind to notice the connections that that exist, right? Borrow directly Descartes' language and the language from Ibn Tufail is the the mental sight. Ibn Tufail was an Islamic philosopher who wrote a philosophical novel called Hay Ibn Yaqsan, which explores the ways that humans can know reality and the divine. It's another work our students read in PPT. And what I like about Anambata is it brings this out is like you see for yourself there's a particular view that you have in mind of a relationship that exists out in the world that you've stumbled upon from your philosophical wondering. And your job now is to convey this to someone else, but not in a formal sense. The whole point is to help them go through this realization internally, right? Like have in their own mental intuition the same kind of shiny, bright, glorious moment of recognition of of what's happening. In fact, this moment of recognition is what Anumbata says makes inference its own particular way of knowing. The Sanskrit term for this moment is paramarsha. It's a reflection on the way that the particular case at hand is subsumed under the general rule, like how the mountain that has smoke on it is subsumed under the rule that whatever has smoke has fire. Now, another element of Descartes' work that Cathay found resonates with Anambatta and with Indian philosophy more generally is its systematic nature. When I'm doing philosophy, I really like these large systematic thinkers or bodies of thought in which someone or a group of people are engaged in taking the human experience and trying to kind of interrogate it in a very specific way and come up with their version of how to explain what's going on and what the connections and the relationships that they see. And so I think for me, rather than getting bogged down in is there a self or isn't there a self, it's more I'm interested in seeing like, okay, so you think there isn't a self. Why do you think that? Um, How does that view jive with the rest of the experiences? Like, what are you noticing about the interplay of this view and the phenomenon of, like, being who you are in the world? I'm interested in looking at the kind of systematic connections and then kind of comparing that to people who think there is a self, right? So in in this sense, you can look at philosophy from all sorts of different traditions and kind of view them from the inside. And there's going to be moments where they overlap and touch, but I always find that even if they're talking about seemingly the same topic, the flavor Mm -hmm. of the question Mm -hmm. comes up very differently because it exists in a different background of other questions and problems that formed in a very specific or particular way. And which brings me to the other thing that I was getting excited about is that in looking at different traditions and different thought, one of the things that's always fascinated me is figuring out what's at the core, what's at the heart of like where a certain tradition starts and what they take for granted. If you start with certain background assumptions, your philosophical bunkers, where just you have to take everything else for granted, then addressing the rest of the philosophical landscape, right? Like certain problems come up in in different ways. And for me, the fascination has always been comparing and viewing what's going on from really different angles in, in that way. And those angles intersected at Yale and U.S., in large part because of the multiple traditions being brought together. Because I I do think it was crazy they let us do this. It was amazing. I don't think I've had a more intellectually stimulating period of time. And like, as great as graduate school was, when, when someone was telling you you can indulge your intellectual curiosity and get paid for it, which sounds amazing. And then like, to get hired to kind of put together this curriculum, reading amazing works with a lot of different people, with really bright students. I mean, that it's just been incredible. And part of me is, it's kind of sad that Yale NUS and PPT is coming to an end, but I also feel really proud of the work we did. And 
and just grateful to have been able to shape a, a large section of it. Yeah. 